On May 3rd, 1901, the third largest urban fire in U.S. history and one of the worst disasters in the state of Florida struck the city of Jacksonville. Today on Fiery Tales, we're going to explore this great Jackson fire of 1901 and the stories that it still has for us in the 21st century. Now, in 1901, Jacksonville was a city of 30,000 people, and they primarily lived in wooden houses with wooden roofs. Now, the community had suffered from a prolonged drought over the past uh, several months uh, that had left these wooden structures uh, dried out and especially susceptible to the risk of fire. Now, around noon on May 3rd, 1901, employees from the Cleveland Fiber Factory located on Beaver and Davis Street went home for lunch. A few minutes after they left, um, a fire was sparked in a pile of Spanish moss that they had laid out on this giant rack uh, to dry, to use in their fibers. Now, the employees who were nearby saw this happen, and they raced to the factory and tried to douse the fire uh, with buckets of water. Apparently, this has happened many other times, and they had been able to get it under control each time. However, this time, um, the winds were blowing especially strong from the northwest, uh, and they quickly fanned the flames, increasing the size of the fire until it was out of control. Uh, but their efforts meant that the alarm was delayed. So the first one is not transmit transmitted until 12.35 p.m., uh, when George Hoden, who worked for the company, had gone home from lunch and was in a tavern, saw them trying to battle this blaze and ran a block away and pulled box 57, which transmitted into Jacksonville Fire Department Alarm Center. Uh, now, at the time, uh, the Jacksonville Fire Department was led by Chief William Hanley. Um, he lived at the Central Fire Station and led a company of 36 paid firefighters. Now, the Jacksonville Fire Department had first been organized in 1850. Um, we see the first real volunteer fire company in 1868. And in 1886, uh, their transition to all career staff after a uh, tragic fire uh, where there had been some issues led to the death of one of the volunteer firefighters. In 1901, uh, they had three stations uh, station one located on Forsyth Street, station two at Pine and Ashley Streets, and station three at the 500 block of East Bay Street. Now, all three of these fire stations would be destroyed in the configuration that would uh, soon erupt. Now, it's uncertain, but most likely, or at least what I could find online, um, did make it clear, but most likely, um, they did operate a series of steamers, uh, but it did make it clear that there were numerous hose wagons. Uh, so it is possible that they simply operated hose wagons off of a hydrant system, but there were probably were some steamers in operation in the city. Uh, now, Chief Hanley, he lived at the Central Fire Station. So when the alarm went off, uh, he comes out, drops down the pole, um, and responds out. Now, unfortunately, during the fire, um, Chief Hanley, uh, all of his possessions and his dog Willie um, would be destroyed by the fire uh, when the fire station um, burned to the ground. Uh, now he would be and his men would be commended uh, for their actions. Um, he especially be, collapsed several times during heat and um, hard work during the fire. Uh, now there were some contemporary reports that he had like a nervous breakdown and some even reported he committed suicide. But um, later, um, after the fire was contained and you get the reports from the people who were actually on the scene, um, they were recognized for the heroic action of the fire department and the chief. Now, there is one report that the fire department um, initially let the fire burn in what was a predominantly African-American neighborhood. Um, and refused to work in that area and instead said it would be better off for that neighborhood to burn to the ground. Uh, but that only appears in one report at the time. So it's uncertain that, you know, that's really unconfirmed. 
Um, but the fire department, uh, they respond quickly. And by the time they arrived, the fire had spread from the original factory. And what's happening is that wind is blowing balls of this moss that was on fire for blocks. Um, so we get all these giant flying embers that are going around and lying, landing on these wooden roofs uh, that have been dried out by the drought. And Chief Hanley soon sees that this is going to be the big one, that the city is going to be challenged by this fire. And at 12.50, 15 minutes after the first alarm, he issues a general alarm for everybody to come help. And what he does then is backs up several blocks away, sending hose wagons back for longer lays because he knows they're basically going to have to let a portion of the city burn. Um, now, over the next hour, eight hours, uh, unfortunately, the fire department was unable to stop the fire. And it eventually burns 146 blocks, um, which accounts, accounts for 2,368 buildings and left almost 10,000 people or a third of the population homeless. Uh, now, this wind was the biggest issue. Basically, the firefighters and residents would try to fight the fire at a specific spot, and the wind would blow embers you know, up to six or seven blocks away and start new fires, which would then blow and more embers and create more fires. So basically, the firefighters were outflanked or just overwhelmed at every spot they stopped. Uh, plus, the wind blowing the already burning buildings just created intense infernos, an intense amount of heat. In fact, the heat was reportedly so hot uh, that the Confederate monument located in Hemings Plaza in the city reportedly glowed red. Um, it was one of the few things that survived the fire, and people reported there was glowing red just from the heat. So you can imagine just how overwhelming the fire was in, you know, approaching inferno status as it's kind of moving through the city. Uh, now it burns a swath that's a half a mile wide and two miles long uh, from the corner of Davis and Ashley Street to the river. Uh, now also later in the day, the wind switched and started to burn the fire southward. Uh, and this is when it started to hit much of the city's retail and civic center. Uh, but by around 8.30, um, the wind dies enough that the firefighters line that they had established at Bay Street was able to hold, uh, and the fire's under control at 8.30 p.m. Uh, now, it was so intense that basically everyone in this area of the city and other unaffected areas thought were going to burn are just fleeing out into the countryside. Some of them even get trapped in docks and have to be evacuated from by boats. Um, and the fire could be seen from as far away as Savannah, the glow, and the smoke was visible in Raleigh, purportedly visible in Raleigh, North Carolina. So that's a huge distance to be able to see this both the glow from the fire and the smoke. Um, and unfortunately, at least seven people died, though most likely that number is a lot higher um, because they're, you know, in the chaos and things, people may be drowned trying to escape in the water. You know, they were consumed by the fire um, and no evidence really remains um, of their deaths. Um, the aftermath was very intense. Uh, journalist H.L. Mekin of the Baltimore Sun wrote, quote, there seemed to be nothing left save for a fringe of houses around the municipal periphery, like a hair on a friar's head, end quote. So basically he's saying the entire center portion of Jacksonville, Florida was just destroyed. Um, it burned, the fire was so intense, it burned stone buildings, brick buildings to the ground. You know, they, just, they were just basically wiped out. Um, the fire just basically creates flashover and, um, you know, at like an outside flashover that just consumed these buildings um, as it approached, even though they were supposedly, you know, fireproof. Uh, the temperatures and things are just so high that they light everything off. Um, the only thing that really survived 
Um, apart from the monument was St. Andrew's Episcopal Church, which was, one, was a brick church. Um, the fire was kind of went around that one. Uh, but everything else, including other brick and stones buildings, were just destroyed. Um, that also included the Duval County Courthouse, which lost all land records and still today um, in reporting on land transactions has a um, designation that marks records as before fire and after fire. Uh, Governor William Jennings of the state of Florida, uh, the, de the destruction is so high that he declares martial law and sends in the militia um, until May 17th in order to try to get things under control um, in the city. But the people in Jacksonville, uh, you know, they're very resilient and they bounce back very quickly. In fact, a temporary building permit uh, for someone to start reconstruction was issued the very next day. And within five months, there would be a thousand building permits issued to rebuild part of the city. Now, uh, part of this was New York City architect Henry Kalutho, K-L-U-T-H-O. And he brought um, kind of this prairie style uh, that was popular from around the country uh, to the city and created a couple landmarks um, that were built soon after this fire as part of this style as they were reworking uh, the city of Jacksonville. Now, I would like to thank um, the Jacksonville Public Library, uh, the Jacksonville Fire Rescue Department, the Florida Times Union newspaper, the Jacksonville Historical Society, Metro Jacksonville, and of course, Wikipedia, uh, which I use for research on this video and um, who credit should be given for the photographs that you see in the background that show the destruction of the city, um, people fleeing from the fire, and just how horrific um, it certainly was to have lived through the great Jacksonville fire of 1901. So I'd like to thank you um, for tuning in to this uh, episode of Fiery Tales, um, where we discuss historic fires, their background, um, the destruction that they wrought, and maybe some lessons that we can learn today. Um, if you found value in this, please hit like. Um, I would also love to hear some feedback in the comments, questions, or other information you want to share about this fire. Um, and as always, if you want to be the first to know about uh, new videos or to stay on top of others as they come out, you know, hit that subscribe button, that bell, uh, so that you get notifications once um, I release new videos about new fires. So thanks again for tuning in and hope you have a wonderful day.